What's on your video? The video, uh, I basically get up and say, hi, I'm Eric Nelson. I uh, wanted to take a moment to show you our store, introduce you to some key employees, and tell you how we do business. And I basically go through and say, um, you know, we're a low markup, internet wholesale type of operation. We, you know, we don't have a huge amount of markup. We have fair prices. You can see that we have reasonable prices. We look at our cars before we sell them to you. Um, yeah, I introduce you to, to the, to the um, the employees. Um, I introduce the fact that you know that we're nice people to work with, um, and and tell people that you know we're committed 110 percent to customer satisfaction. It's not just a gimmick in our ad, or not just a gimmick somewhere. That we're seriously committed to it, um, and then hit them too with we take all trade-ins, we take everything, um, and just to touch on on inventory for a second since I'm talking here. Uh, we put out there in all of our ads and everything, everything we come to, we take all trade-ins. Uh, we want all cars. We buy cars. We buy anything. We'll take anything as a trade-in. Bring us your boat. Bring us your... Uh, why, do you, why do you emphasize that? Because people sometimes think, oh, I've got this, this old Subaru with a, with a knocking engine and a transmission that slips. Uh, you wouldn't possibly want that. I'm not even going to bring it in. You wouldn't want it. And someone will bring it in. I'll say, no, no, no. Bring us everything. We want everything. Bring it in. And they bring it in. I go, well, well, how much do you want for it? Oh, just give me $100. And I run it through the auction and get two grand for it. You know, so a lot of those people um, that bring that stuff in, you don't get many of them, but they're just absolute gold. Um, you know, and, and if, I, I think Lascota said in one of his classes at some point, uh, you know, if someone offers to, to, to bring in pigs on trade, why not take them? If you can, if you can find an outlet to sell the pig, who cares if, if someone you know if the pig's worth five hundred dollars? Take a pig as a trade-in because your your competitor's not going to, you know. I and took a pig on trade once. <laughs> <laughs> as professor was good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and there's there's all kinds of stuff that you put your sign up by the road saying we buy cars, we buy everything. Um, another little trick is we've got uh, when I have cargo vans in, we have uh, magnetic stickers that say we buy cars. And we beat uh, the big guy's offers, the big guy's being in CarMax's logo and font and everything. Um, and you can drive that around. I'll stick that on my car when I'm driving it. Because, and you won't get too much response from that. But if you get a car or two a month and you make an extra 1000 or $2,000 in those cars, what does is, what is the, the stickers and everything cost you? You know, 500 bucks? Uh, that's a pretty good ROI to me. So. You learned about ROI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I did take a pig on trade. Anyone else do that? <laughs> Alabama boy had to somewhere. Along the way. <laughs> <laughs> this one did. Uh, actually, a farmer brought it, and the pig was alive. And he said, that's all he had to trade. So uh, I got a PA system and asked my employees who want fresh pork. And then I called the butcher and asked what, he caught, uh, what it cost to chop one up. We gave him a figure, traded, and we had fresh bacon. See? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. I've taken pianos. Yeah, I've taken yeah. pianos, <laughs> diamond rings. Everything has a value. Any questions? Yeah. What's your website? Uh, our website is heycars.com. That's H E Y C A R S dot com. Say one more time. H E Y C A R S dot com. Hey, cars. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, okay, so as far as best practices for advertising, we're on AutoTrader and Cars.com. Cars.com is extremely strong in the Chicago market. Um, and we're also on Craigslist, and, and a bunch of those places export to uh, a bunch of other random places. Um, but at, at least in my market, and a, and a lot of people's market, I think, if you've got inventory uh, that, that works well on the internet, and, and that's what I focus on getting, is getting inventory that works well on the internet, 
then I think you should be advertising on OurTrader, Cars.com, and Craigslist for sure, because it's free. Again, even if not that many people um, find you on it, what's the ROI if you only had to spend a salesman's hour of time posting these things? Um, in terms of advertising on these websites, uh, I think you absolutely have to have, I mean, we use 27 pictures. Um, and we have our pictures taken in front of a, a, a curtain in our, in our shop. And we have a curtain up because otherwise you're taking your pictures outside, you're taking your pictures um, somewhere. And if you take your pictures outside, uh, what happens when you take your pictures outside right between um, spring and summer or something? You know, you're taking it between the seasons. So right, you take it right when the leaves are falling. And a week later, there's snow on the ground. Someone goes on your, on your thing and they see, oh, there's dead leaves in this picture. They must have had this car for a while. And it's a bad impression. And um, so you can do things to make your pictures look better. But you absolutely have to have uh, a good number of pictures. Um, we have our video uh, on AutoTrader, at least, as well. And we try to get people over to our website. And actually, about 60% of the people who buy from us were on our website before they purchased. Um, other things in, in online advertising are you want to, of course, make your car stand out in the first two sentences because when people are scrolling through autotrailercars.com, et cetera, they're looking at the first two sentences. That's what's visible to them. So, of course, we always start with you know, one owner, clean car facts, and then recently serviced with brand new tires, brand new brakes. This has the ultra package with you know, so and so and so and so. Whatever is the absolute biggest hook has to be right away. Um, that kind of answer that? Question? What about the vehicles you sell? How many vehicles do you move? Uh, uh, in the winter, we usually move about, in the low 20s. In the summer, we move about 40. Um, and I keep about a 40 to 50 car inventory. Uh, in Chicago, I know I can sell a million imports. Um, I will sell anything, because if I get something in off one of my ads or something, and I say, OK, there's, there's some demand for this. I can sell older American stuff, uh, especially with low miles. Anything that's relatively unique, anything that's, um, that there's not that many of them out there, those are the easier things to sell on the internet, the stuff that's unique. The stuff that's really unique, uh, if you get a limo or an old Maserati or stuff like that, that's the eBay type stuff where you really want to pull from a, a national market. But um, I do well even with cameras and stuff like that, but I have to recognize that when I'm buying anything that's a higher volume car, that there's more of them out there, like a Camry or something like that, it's a low margin. So I buy it going into it knowing it has to be cheaper um, and I want to sell it quick. I want to you know, turn it as quick as I can. And then some cars, internet cars, older luxury cars, stuff like that, uh, there's higher grosses on and they might take a little bit longer to move, but I can count on a higher gross. Question? Um, I would, the question was about price range. I would love to have all $5,000 cars on my lot because um, there's never a time when you can't sell a $5,000 car. It's, it's strong all, all year long. How many fi good $5,000 cars can you find, though? Not many. And I, I tend not to buy something if I think I'm only going to make $500 on it. So um, I have as many cheap things as I can get a deal on, but then a lot of my inventory is ten dollars to $15,000 off-lease. Um, stuff like that. I, I tr again, try not to have too much stuff that there's a million of them out there. I personally have a harder time moving a three-year-old off-lease Mercedes because there's a ton of them out there. Uh, if it's a, a five- or six-year-old Mercedes with good miles on it, I, I'm all over that. I love those. Um, so it depends, but something that's less common is going to be much easier to sell on the Internet. The questions regarding reconditioning what he spends? It varies, um, of course. I do buy a lot of stuff uh, that's not as clean, and, and at least in my market, for what I know, for Chicago, where um, some people, like my mom, think that bumpers are meant for bumping, uh, some people don't actually expect cars to be pristine. Now, a lot of people want them to be you know, perfect. I'm sure that's most of the customers you get in your lot. But, um, I tend to buy a lot of cars that maybe aren't perfect with a few dings, dents, things like that, that I can uh, spray a bumper, pop out some dents, and be into it for, uh, for less money than buying a cleaner one at the sale. Um, so when that comes up, it, it, it's variable. Um, 
I'd say probably on average maybe a few hundred bucks a car. And if I buy something nice, it doesn't need much, obviously nothing. But um, I've got a, uh, a full-time tech at the store, and, and I highly recommend having a, a tech at your store because um, you know, it boggles my mind to think how much money you'll spend if you send every brake job out, if you spend everything out. And if you've got a good tech, he can do a brake job in a half an hour or you know, 45 minutes. Um, and then when you just bring in a little retail work, and I, I personally do retail work for my customers at $65 an hour, which is cheap, um, but I like to market myself as cheap and, uh, or inexpensive, I guess. And, and it, it brings in um, retail customers to buy cars. If you keep them in front of you, if you keep them coming into you every once in a while, um, you keep that relationship alive. So I recommend that. Now, Mickey, you also do some reconditioning in a different way or aggressively? That's correct. Uh, <clears throat> we have a emission testing where I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's a east, east Tennessee toward Georgia. And uh, we, we go through and pinpoint on our cars. We used to buy cars that were $5,000 to $7,000. Now the cars turned into $6,000 to $9,000, as everyone knows. And uh, we go to, if they need tires, we put tires on them. If they need rotors, brakes air condition repair, we really don't patch any of the cars. If we find a major problem on the car, we're going to take them to the auction, uh, send them through with the red light as is and dispose of the cars. And uh, we make sure we've got a clean, fresh, crisp car when uh, people come in and look at our cars. Uh, we also, uh, we do a, a daily venture on starting our cars. Uh, we have a, all of my employees are, are team members, so as a team we go together, including myself, uh, we go out and start the cars. We open the trunks to make sure they're not leaking water. Uh, we make sure that when the customer gets in the car, they don't hear. Or they don't hear. <laughs> and uh, it really makes a big difference. We uh, freshen up, our, I was telling Joe a little bit earlier, we freshen up our interior of our cars. We use either Febreze sheets or we use a, a sock. We put coffee in with cut up apples and put in the seat to have a fresh smell in the car. Would you explain that, elaborate on your socks? <laughs> well, we I start out with a clean sock, and uh, we use uh, coffee granules and uh, apples. Where a lot of times we buy cars at the auction, and uh, or they've been cleaned in our detail shop. Uh, they may uh, saturate the carpets too much, so we keep from having some type of a, a bad odor in the car. We also use Febreze. Uh, Let's go back to the sock. Say, so have a clear picture. You take a sock. We take a sock. You pour coffee in the sock. We take an athletic white sock. We pour coffee in the sock. Two, and then cup, two cups of coffee. In two the cups sock. of coffee. Fresh coffee, not used. And, and then you put an apple. We get an apple. We cut it in quarters and slice it up in pieces and put in. Now, you don't want to leave it in there too long. <laughs> but as it comes in fresh, and it only takes a couple of days to freshen a car up, it eliminates a lot of the odors. And it's a lot, of, a lot less expensive than using an ozone machine that I paid way too much for and we never use it anymore. You keep the sock in there for no more than two days. Yeah, about two days. Yeah, it's about two days. Actually, there is. Uh, actually, uh, if you know, look at uh, drug dealers, they hide narcotics in coffee to try to fool dogs. Uh, coffee is a, a, it's just really a phenomenal uh, deodorizer. The, uh, the apple itself, uh, acidic, will uh, activate the coffee. It actually smells like leather inside your vehicle. Yeah, so if you have dirty socks, you can try the same thing. Uh, <laughs> Good work. Just Good work. Uh, make yourself a cup of coffee, throw a lecture in your sock. <laughs> is it coffee grounds or co coffee Coffee grounds, yeah, these, grounds. yeah. Coffee okay. grounds. Coffee yeah. grounds. It, only works it does not have grounds. to be gourmet coffee, just any coffee blend will do. No sugar added, yeah. <laughs> no sugar. It gets ants. You get ants. But uh, we also use, uh, we're in a high humidity area, so our humidity in Chattanooga is really, really extensive. And uh, so a lot of people use their air conditioners this time of the year, and they just pull in. They don't cut them off a mile, like you're supposed to, a mile before you get to your destination, uh, and cool them down. Uh, what they usually do, just like most everyone else, is have it on high, make sure it's cooling as, as much as possible, then to pull the car up, stop it, and park it. Well, in a lot of cars, especially in your imports and your Hondas and Toyotas, you, you accumulate uh, mold and mildew smell, so it smells like a dirty sock. So when the, you get a customer who gets in a car on a real hot day, it's 90, 95 degrees, 100 degrees, they first start the car up, 
the last person drove the car didn't touch the air conditioner or the blower's still on high, first thing they have is that moldy smell coming to them. So using this Febreze in there, really it eliminates the odor in there and it, it really, uh, we have a lot of women that make decisions on the purchases of cars that come into our dealerships. And if that blows in their face right to begin with, they're looking for other reasons not to buy the car. Uh, we also check the, uh, on a daily basis, we check, uh, make sure the trunks are uh, dry. If, it, if we've had rain, we have a lot of extensive rain. We make sure we don't have uh, puddles of water in the uh, trunks. Make sure there's nothing floating in the back seat like the carpet mats in the back seats. And uh, just things that would prevent someone from picking one thing out on the car that they might not like. And it puts us, it puts us really ahead of the competition. It gives us the edge. How large is your inventory? Excuse me? How large is your inventory? I keep, uh, I keep 35 cars on each lot, <coughs> um, all three lots. And uh, I do this in a, I work as a, like a new car dealer, it's an earn and turn basis. Um, I started uh, one of my lots, I was keeping 151 cars on there. And I uh, took the CMD class. I realized how much it cost me to keep these cars in inventory rather than turning the inventory on a regular basis. And instead of looking at my monthly turn, I look at the annual turn on my inventory. So it, actually I can stock in less cars, have less investment. I can have more return on the investment. And it actually increases my bottom line tremendously on a monthly basis. And Eric, you said you're carrying 40 to sell 40 as well. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, you know, 40 to 50 to sell 40 in the summer, and in the winter I, I carry more, but that's because, you know, you can stock up on, on some nice lower price stuff in the, in the winter, and so I don't mind okay. letting some stuff age to perfection. Um, but, you know, you should let your convertibles age from, uh, from winter to summer. That's the right way to age things, you know. Don't let the minivans age from, you know, summer to winter. All right, Amanda, I'm not sure how many questions I'll have for you, so I apologize and I hope I don't bore you to death. Uh, but being from Mannheim, uh, dealers, I heard maybe one dealer out of 5,000 asked about inventory and how to get it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, so if you want to talk about inventory, fine. If not, something else. Sure, I'll talk <laughs> about inventory. So my name's Mandy, and, um, and I, as I said, I'm from Mannheim. And um, I spend a lot of time talking to dealers, and I travel around the country teaching a workshop teaching dealers how to find inventory, how to use the digital tools that are available. And so I know that inventory is uh, a challenge today. Um, and dealers are getting really creative, like putting signs in papers and wrapping their cars saying, we'll buy your cars. Um, but there's still a lot of inventory out there. And there's ways to find it. Uh, there's tools out there to find it to help you work smarter and faster. So um, even though today, you may, if you go to the physical auctions, you'll notice that there are fewer cars in the lanes, and that's just, that just is what it is. There's fewer cars in the marketplace as a whole. Um, so we're trying to tap into inventory that's sitting in dealer's lots through channels like ove.com. Smart Auction does the same thing, to try to help dealers find inventory through alternative ways. So not only are there alternative channels to buy inventory outside of the physical auction lanes, there's OVE, Smart Auction, Open Lane, they're all available to you. There's also ways to find inventory, um, to search for inventory that I guess are more efficient than they were in the past. So, you know, years ago, I used to work at an auction, and it was a commonplace for a dealer to come in on a Tuesday, the day before the sale, and walk cars all day and look for inventory, and then come back on a Wednesday on sale day and walk those same cars again and stand in line and try to buy them, and maybe the dealer got lucky and maybe they didn't. And today, that's just... I mean, we love seeing you at the auctions, but it's an inefficient way to do business. And my question to dealers is, when you're spending two days out of your office trying to, trying to buy cars, who's running your dealerships? And I would guess that the person that's running it probably isn't as good as running it as you are. So it's interesting to talk about the tools that are out there to help you uh, do your homework a little bit better and find cars a little bit more efficiently. So over the past couple of years, Mannheim specifically has been investing in um, in new ways to search for inventory. Mobile's been a big catalyst for that. So today, you can search for inventory on manheim.com. You can set up save searches. You can set up notifications so that any time a vehicle that you're looking for specifically comes anywhere in any one of our channels, you can get a text message that says, hey, this car's available. Um, a lot of dealers who still like going to the physical auctions are taking that day that they used to, that first day where they used to go to the auction and do their homework, and they're doing that online, and mobile tools are enabling to do, them to do that better. 
So for example, you can get into Mannheim.com, you can do a power search, you can pull up a run list, um, you can do all your homework, you can make notes online, and everything that you do on Mannheim.com is compatible with your mobile device. So whether you have an iPhone or an Android or a Blackberry, you can stand in the lanes on sale day if you so choose and look at your notes and look at condition reports. And nowadays when I go into an auction, it's funny, I see dealers standing there with their iPads and there may be a few guys like walking around the cars kind of feeling for seams and trying to figure out, you know, does this car have cold air and does it smell okay? And then there's other dealers that are just standing back with their iPads and they're looking at the condition reports. They're saying, yeah, I'll bid on that one or I'll let that one pass. So there's interesting ways to find inventory that are meant to help you um, as the market is more challenging in that way um, and ways to be more efficient. Um, another thing that I tell dealers, especially when it comes to inventory, is because the prices are so high on, in the wholesale marketplace today, um, if you're looking for stock inventory, don't look outside your market. You know, pick a search, pick an area that you're comfortable transporting cars and stick with it. You don't need to look, do a national search to find Ford Focuses. You can probably find a lot of Ford Focuses within 250 miles, maybe 500 miles if you're in a pretty rural area. And by looking in your backyard, you know, you've, not only are you going to be able to reduce your transportation costs on top of whatever you pay for the vehicle, you'll be able to get the vehicle faster, you'll be able to turn it faster, um, and hopefully get that car off your books as soon as you get it on. And then one other thing I'll touch on, and then I'll take any questions if y'all have them, is something like a retail view. So have any of you heard of retail view, or do, do any of you use it in, in Maine? I see some people nodding their heads. Basically what retail view allows you to do is search for inventory in the Mannheim marketplace, and you can look for inventory, you can find the car. Um, if you've got a customer sitting with you in your dealership um, that maybe wants a specific vehicle that you don't have, um, since inventory is scarce, you can find the car in, in any one of Mannheim's channels. You can price the car to the customer, click the retail view button, give them a picture and a description of the car, sell the car to them sight unseen, take a deposit, and then give that customer first right of refusal once that vehicle um, gets to your lot. Um, if you buy that car on OVE and for some reason you lose your customer, then you've got options. We've got an, a buyback policy on OVE that's pretty uh, good to know about. Um, so if for some reason you, you lose your customer or uh, the deal falls through, you're not obligated to keep the car. You can actually imp implement the buyback policy. So for those of you that may be a little uncomfortable buying online or are still kind of dipping your toes in the water, it's a good policy to know about because it just adds a layer of protection when it comes to a uh, buying car sight unseen. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what is the life for it? What's the difference between going to an auction? You get a lot of complaints from people that die on, on, off the auction. Do not see the car when it gets to the delivery point. Um, we, uh, do we, the question is, do I get a lot of complaints from customers who buy cars sight unseen, basically? Um, and the answer is, not really. I mean, our condition reports have gotten better over the years. Um, I had a dealer that I was talking to yesterday say, well, you know, I had a really bad experience. I bought, I bought a car online. Well, when did you buy it? Two and a half years ago. Well, things have changed in two and a half years, you know, and I'm sorry that he had a bad experience. Um, but our condition reports have gotten a lot better, and we've invested in them heavily. And um, they're not perfect. We still have people writing them up. But we've standardized our training processes. We've, standard, we've standardized our grading processes um, to try to build some consistency into the way that we write them. And in doing that, we get less and less complaints. Um, so if you are kind of riding the fence and you're not sure, I would suggest you do an exercise on your own. Print out a couple of condition reports for vehicles that you're interested in purchasing. And when you go to the physical auction and you walk those cars, just kind of compare and contrast and think to yourself, could I, you know, if I had stayed home and bought this car on simulcast, would this have been a good experience or not? And sort of, you know, take some baby steps that way to get comfortable. If I can add, the Mannheim's condition reports are very detailed. Um, I buy some stuff online sometimes, and my challenge is usually uh, if something's listed on there and it says hail, uh, how heavy is the hail? Because there's a big difference between light hail and, you know, hail where it's cracking the paint. Um, so, but their condition reports are really pretty good. Um, I buy a lot of stuff online and you know usually if I buy something and I'm disappointed with it uh, it's I know that I was gambling I know it said multiple scratches throughout and I, you know and sometimes I buy something and it says multiple scratches multiple things and I get it back and I go oh that's a lot better than I expected um, so they're they're very thorough 
Questions? Yes. Explain the OVE buyback program. Sure. So um, basically the OVE buyback policy says that for any vehicle that you buy on OVE.com, for any reason you don't want the car, you can take it back to your nearest Mannheim location. Now there's some stipulations that go along with that. The car cannot exceed $40,000. You have two weeks to implement the buyback policy from the day you buy it, not the day you get it. So from the day you buy it, you've got two weeks. Um, you will lose your fees. So you lose your buy fee on the transaction and you have to get a post-sale inspection. In the world of best practices, it's probably a good idea to get a post-sale inspection when you're buying cars sight unseen, but you will lose that money. And you'll lose your transportation, um, but you'll only lose transportation one way. So here's what I mean when I say that. Um, I, let's say I live in Atlanta and if I'm a dealer and I buy a car on OVE that's in Pennsylvania and that car comes to me and I lost my customer on the vehicle and I don't want to keep it. I don't have to ship the car back to Pennsylvania. I can return the car to my nearest auction in Georgia. So I take it straight back there. They'll buy the car back from me. Um, the car cannot be as is. And you can't make money on the buyback policy. So here's what I mean when I say that. Um, we'll give you up to 102% of national average MMR when you buy the vehicle. If you pay over that, we'll pay, give you 102%. If you pay less than that, we'll give you what you paid for it. So you can't make money on the policy, but that's how it works. So dealers use it. I'll give you a kind of a real life example of how a customer might use it. There was a dealer in Pennsylvania and he keeps, an uh, independent dealer keeps uh, late model domestics primarily on his lot. That's his sweet spot. And he had a lady come in and she wanted a $23,000 Lexus. Well, that was sort of outside of his, what he normally keeps on his lot, outside of the price range that he normally has. But he bought the car for her because uh, she, her, she had financing and everything. It was going to be a done deal. He bought the car on OVE out of Florida. Um, the lady wound up having some health issues and she wasn't able to complete the transaction. So it was a perfect opportunity for this m man to implement the buyback policy. So he just implemented the buyback policy. The car hadn't even been shipped yet. So he just returned it to the auction in Florida where it was sitting, got his money back for the car. And yeah, he lost his buy fee and yeah, he lost the money for the post-sale inspection. But his floor plan wasn't tied up on a car, a $23,000 car that he can't sell. So for him, it was a really good experience.